I need some traction. Our guest today on the Traction Podcast is a legend in Silicon Valley in the tech scene. He was instrumental to the success of PayPal, LinkedIn, Slide, and Square. Five companies he helped build are now publicly traded with market caps of greater than a billion. Three others have been acquired for greater than a billion or are publicly traded IPOs. He served on the boards of Zoom, Yelp, Reddit, Affirm, and others. He's an investor in several iconic multi-billion dollar brands, including YouTube, Airbnb, Palantir, Eventbrite, Lyft, Quora, and the list goes on and on. He's a GP at Tier 1 Venture Capital Fund, Founders Fund. He's the co-founder of Open Door, which went public, and more recently, the CEO of Open Store. What haven't you done? Welcome to Traction, Keith. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be with you. I've got a lot more to do, so don't worry. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you've had a terrific journey beyond anyone's imagination. Give us your backstory. How did you get to where you are today? Well, I'm not sure I'd replicate this backstory, but uh, I started as a lawyer. So I went to law school. I clerked for a well-known federal appellate court judge. I practiced law for about three and a half years, and then I quit cold turkey at the height of the, at the, height of the internet bubble. Uh, to join the internet revolution. So I wasted basically all my 30s in law school preparing to be a lawyer practicing law. So not necessarily the most conventional path, nor necessarily the best path, uh, but it, it somehow or another worked, which maybe there's a lesson there. And then how did you how did you get to PayPal? Like what was what was that like? You know, how did you make that transition from being a law school student and then saying, forget it, I'm gonna move into tech? Well, so I jumped into a startup at the height of the internet bubble in February 2000. The market collapsed and the internet revolution bubble was sort of blown apart in late March of 2000. So I had about six weeks uh, to find a new job sort of thing. Um, and as the internet was crashing and my startup was starting to show signs of turmoil and stress and inability to potentially raise money as the world corrected, something uh, somewhat akin to what we saw recently in October 2021, um, I called up my friend from college, Peter Thiel, and said, what do you think I should do next? And Peter had been recently uh, re-energized as interim CEO of PayPal. And I was just asking for advice or wh what he thought was still possible to achieve in the internet and where he could direct me to. And he said, you know what, I can introduce you to direct quote. I can introduce a lot of people who want to come work for us. So he was about six weeks into his job as interim CEO. Um, I was living on the East Coast, wound up flying cross country, moving, starting like four days later, uh, and joined PayPal. And did you, this is roughly around November 2000. When you joined, did you know, or was there an energy that made you feel it's going to be this big global phenomenon that it would end up being? Yes and no. So the company was burning a lot of money, $10 million a month pretty recently, which back then was a ton of money. Uh, secondly, Peter was the third CEO in five months, which is usually not a good sign. Uh, but the brand resonated. Uh, PayPal at the time, I remember reading a study, was the eighth most recognizable brand in the internet. So I thought at a minimum, people would know what the hell, where I worked. Um, it's not, you know, I mean, not success criteria, but certainly better than failing. Uh, and then secondarily, I knew some of the people that worked with Peter uh, from college. Uh, many of us went, that's how I knew Stanford, uh, Peter from Stanford as an undergrad. So I thought there was definitely smart people there and there's a recognizable brand. And, you know, one way or the other, maybe this could work out. But no, it was not obviously going to work. Uh, Peter was, as I said, interim CEO. People on the board hadn't even had enough confidence to install him as permanent CEO yet. So there's a lot of work to do, but I said, you know what? I don't have any better ideas. Let's go roll the dice. At least they're smart people. Now that said, once I showed up in the office four days later, the energy and vibe was very different and completely distinct from my prior startup. Uh, people were universally smart, talented, ambitious, and worked their ass off. And then you you stuck out the whole ride till the till the exit and whatnot. Yeah. So I stayed with PayPal. Uh, we went public in February 20, 20, 20, 2002, and then we decided as a public company to be acquired by eBay, uh, agreed to terms over July 4th weekend and that summer in 2002, 
and then closed the transaction and was, were, was officially acquired by eBay in November 2002. I left a few weeks later in December 2002. And then how did, how did LinkedIn and then Stripe happen from there on? So LinkedIn, um, Reed knew once we were negotiating this transaction with eBay that he wasn't going to want to work at eBay. So he started thinking about ideas and contemplating various versions of the future that he wanted to build. Uh, he had two or three ideas he was working on. As soon as the transaction closed, he left and started working on the best of the ideas, which was LinkedIn in early 2003, uh, put together a small team to build it, shipped it. In June of May or June of May, I think of 2003. Uh, so I I was an angel investor in LinkedIn at first. About a year, maybe almost a year and a half later, as the company started to get some traction, I joined the company full time to run business and corporate dev, uh, basically generating revenue for the company. Stripe was a lot. Stripe was a lot later. Um, you know, 20 years basically. Well, at least 10 years went by. And Patrick and John Carlson had an idea that PayPal was kind of already outdated, is already run by a bunch of buffoons and bureaucrats, and that there's an opportunity to build a developer first modern technology stack, innovative product, which turned out to be right. Definitely. Now, there's something about intuition, though, right? Uh, I mean, you talked about the energy, the, the team being super smart, the brand. Um, I think those are all signals that you got to stick to the right because a lot of a lot of the a lot of founders or even like early employees they don't they don't stick right and so if you had to prioritize what those signals were that that hey I'm going to stick around because this is going to be massive what are those signals velocity velocity of shipping velocity of identifying challenges resolving the challenges uh, density of talent people around you you can learn from. That's easier to detect. And the most important thing you can do early in your career is learn, 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 learn. Learning compounds. So the more you learn, the faster you learn, the better you're going to be ultimately. Uh, and then the reality was back in our PayPal days, it was easy to get people to stick because there were no other jobs in tech. The entire internet bubble collapsed. It was basically described as a nuclear winner in technology, which was moderately apt. Uh, so, you know, once we hired somebody, if they were doing their job, they, in practice, we're not going to leave because there were no other opportunities. There's exactly one talented person who left PayPal during my you know, sort of era voluntarily because there really weren't alternatives. Uh, that's very rare. Obviously, the more modern era of technology, there's lots of options, including starting your own company. That is a very real choice for employees. So yeah. once you're a learning curve, what I would basically recommend is that you should stick if you believe in the velocity of the company uh, and you're continuing to learn and challenge yourself, and when, if you plateau or the company plateaus in terms of learning a challenge, then you might consider other options. Fantastic, that's great advice. Now, um, through your journey, what has been the most fun or exciting memory along the way? And maybe the scariest thing you went through or overcame? Oh my God. Um, yeah. So lots of scary moments. Um, people sometimes from afar don't realize how fragile these uh, successful companies actually are in practice. Um, there was a day when we were a very fragile small company at Square when a, a large direct competitor, large at the time, like called three, four billion dollar market cap from a company directly attacked us, complained that we were insecure and dangerous. And, you know, unfortunately, I was in the middle of presenting a speech to Visa and Jack was at a conference. All the witnesses was going live. And so trying to coordinate and respond, it was a little tricky and challenging. I felt like, you know, sort of like, like the president being ambushed with a first strike by the Soviet Union or something. Uh, but we did well. Uh, we made it, you know, through the first few hours, thought, had a thoughtful set of responses. And then basically that company is basically dead um and that was their last desperate move in, uh, in you know in any relevance uh so it turned out to be good, really good for us but didn't feel that the first hour to two to maybe three hours certainly didn't feel that way definitely and you know a lot of a lot of founders now given what's what's happened the roller coaster of the current market are going through chaos in many ways what advice you have from them from your past learnings of dealing with scary moments chaos 
fun rides along the way? Well, I think the first thing is to remember that the roller coaster ride is part of the journey. It's intentional. So if you think about the metaphor of roller coaster, what do you do when you go on a roller coaster? You actually pay money to people to terrify you, make you scream. So it starts kind of like that. You're paying money or paying, you're sweating with your time, volunteering your time to go through terror. Uh, so, but if you know that, it kind of becomes part of the challenge and the reward and just living through it. Um, you know, a piece of practical advice is typically things are never really as good as they feel when you're all the way at the top. And they're usually not as bad as they feel when you're all the way at the bottom. So remembering that um, is, is pretty critical for psychological in a sort of satisfaction. Uh, but that is what you get paid for as an employee, as an executive, as a founder, is navigating the roller coaster ride. So when you have momentum, and you're going this way, you want to preserve the momentum and amplify the momentum as long as you can. And with things going the other way, you want to act as fast as you can to reverse, you know, sort of inertia. Definitely. Now, switching gears to open store, I mean, you've had a very successful career, investments, unicorns. Why start, start open store? given your successful background as an investor operator? There was probably four components to starting a company again from scratch. Uh, one was uh, the idea itself was pretty compelling, which is making e-commerce easy for everybody in the West. We can talk about what that means and why. Number two, why other people haven't been able to achieve that ambition. Number two, there's people I wanted to work with. Um, there's a very specific set of people that I was looking forward to working with. Venture is not the best way to scale an organization or work with a lot of people. You're typically working with a very small number of people all the time. So I was kind of excited uh, to go back into team building and mentoring. Third is, you know, I've been trying to move the entire technology landscape to Miami, the center of gravity here. And so I was po uh, pontificating that people should build their companies in Miami. I felt it'd be a really good thing to build a company in Miami to showcase that it's possible that companies here thrive, et cetera. It's kind of the proverbial eat your dog food kind of thing. And then fourth was the specific challenges associated with open store. Two or three of the core initial challenges were, were related to problems I had solved previously. So I felt it was like a company for me. I actually give this advice and counsel to executives all the time that they should choose opportunities where their unique skill set and DNA is directly down the middle of what the company needs the most. And that's why I joined Square originally. Jack needed an entrepreneurial executive who had some financial services background. At the time, there was very few of those people in the world. So it was perfect for me, which was very motivating and challenging. And the same thing as called open store was directly, directly down the middle of my sweet spot. Definitely. So what is your vision for open store? And, uh, sure. and give us the background of it. How does it work? And, uh, and these challenges that you talked about. So our, our goal is to make e-commerce easy. And that means for consumers and for brands. So people who build a brand online and for consumers. So the brands online, the challenge of running a Shopify store is extremely stressful. It's like a 24-7 operation. You're on this treadmill constantly fighting trends in new customer acquisition, keeping up with retention. There's many, 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 many challenges. And so we make it brain dead simple. For some set of brands and owners, that means they sell the business to us. So they convert the traction, the momentum, the brand they've created into money. And then they can use that money, you know, however they like for the rest of their lives. Others say, I, you know, I don't want to sell my proverbial baby, but I don't want the stress. So we have a new product called Drive where we'll run the business for you and guarantee you next year's cash flow. So you get all the benefits with none of the none of the drag coefficients psychologically. So we have two products designed to make brand brands, Shopify brand owners, their life easy. Uh, on the consumer side, the biggest friction is discovering products that you don't that you don't know about. So if you have search intent, you know exactly what you want. You know, I know I want a Celsius trick. I know how to find that. That's been a solved problem since the late 90s in the US. But when I go to shopping, let's say the design district down here in Miami, I actually discover uh, apparel that I didn't know I wanted, shoes and shoe brands that I may not be familiar with. So I serendipitously discover cool, new, interesting things. And that's what makes life fun. Um, right now, there's no destination. There's no starting point or entry point for consumers in the US and the West to find things that appeal to them specifically that really resonate, but that they had no idea uh, existed even. 
So that's what we're going to that's what we're going to solve for consumers is serendipitous magical discovery. And then, do you work with physical stores that want to go online, or do you uh, do you take on e-commerce stores? You do a combination, it seems. Or- um, right now, we only acquire our businesses that are primarily based on Shopify. Okay. And then in terms of, because the, the, your website says uh, start a store or you know, we run the store for you or we buy a store. So what does we run the store for you mean? So that's our, drive, that's our that's our, that's open stores drive product. And what we do with drive is we will literally do everything for you uh, from customer acquisition, retention, marketing, fulfillment, customer support. You have nothing you need to do except you get passive income. We're going to guarantee you next year's cash flow. And you can sit at home, you can go to the beach, you can start a new brand, you can do whatever is most important to you. We've had people, uh, brand owners who have health issues they want to take care of in their family. We have others who want to you know, take some time off, some who want to study a new field. We allow you to do anything. And what is the ideal customer for that? Um, um, how does one transact with you or, or get you to do business with them? Typically, we're looking to either buy or drive a brand that's selling at least let's say $500,000 worth of product a year annually, up to about $10 million of sales. So that's that's the sweet spot of where open store could probably be most helpful. And all that to do is go to our website, you connect your shop data, and we can give you an offer with one business day. It's either a proposal for Drive or an acquisition offer. Definitely. And and uh, Drive, of course, they own, they keep the store they pay you X amount or, or or like it's a, is it a rev share or how does that work? Yeah. So uh, we will predict and model your next year's cash flow 12 months out. And if you like and believe that that's an accurate uh, model, then we will take 10% of your profits as a fee for being successful in running your store for a year. You can renew at the end of the year or not, depending upon how satisfied you are. Awesome. Um, how did you get your early customers? I mean, this is, this is a very interesting idea. And, you know, I guess, um, uh, one company at least tried to do the financing piece of it, financing for e-commerce. And there's a couple of, uh, those like ClearBank that popped up that, uh, didn't do so well ultimately, but it seems like you're managing the whole supply chain there. That's correct. I don't think a little piece of the puzzle is going to work very well. I think they're going to, those kind of companies are going to suffer from Massive adverse selection. There's a lot of challenges to just doing a financing piece. However, if you're vertically integrated, you, you can make the economics work. So we do everything. That's why we're vertically integrated. It was painful the first year to set up all the vertical integration to be able to do fulfillment, customer support, new customer acquisition. We give all our brands an iOS app. None of the brands we acquired had an iOS app. There's a lot of benefits to having your loyal customers have an iOS app, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's just very differentiated. But it, it did take a lot of time, a lot of people, hard work, sweat to build out all these functions. And did you build your own warehouse facility or have to like contract with 3PL or something? We, 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 have a, we have a kind of a hybrid where we have a contract relationship that's very customized uh, for our needs. Because we, for example, will sell products from multiple brands to one consumer. Ideally, we want those products to arrive in one box. So unless you built out your fulfillment operation to contemplate taking brands and SKUs from multiple places and putting them in one box, it's it's virtually impossible. This is a big idea, though. I mean, like, uh, it's it's not. Uh, is it a problem you experienced, or what? What made you? Well, like, what led you to this? Well, my friend Jack Abraham, who runs a venture studio in Miami named Atomic. Uh, led me to the idea where he basically pointed out, you know, over the last decade, the biggest phenom, perhaps in all technology, has been Shopify. At the time, Shopify was about $165, $165 billion market cap that not a lot of people had been paying attention to. I was pretty familiar with it. So he's like, there's 1.7 million shop stores. It's growing at this rate. And nobody's paying attention to the long tail side of Shopify meaning not famous large brands that are selling hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff. The typical Shopify merchant does not sell hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff. They sell you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars. And he's like, these brands have no access to capital. No one, venture capitalists aren't going to give the money. 
The local bank definitely isn't going to give them money. These debt providers are terrible, all this stuff. So what we provide is liquidity, and we're the only ones really providing liquidity to the long tail part of the market. And then we could stitch these businesses together into a pretty compelling value proposition for the consumer. Um, one way to think about it from a consumer lens that does apply to me is the design district in Miami is about a mile and a half from my house. And I go there moderately frequently, but every time I go there, I have to figure out, you know, traffic patterns, parking patterns. It just takes a lot of time to go back and forth. And so if I thought through what drives me to go to the design district, why am I going there? Why am I putting up a description? The hours they're open even are not particularly compelling for someone who has a job. So how do I solve this digitally? And the real reason I go there is typically to find things that I don't know I need. It's like I want to walk around and wander and be exposed to new ideas, new products, new 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 palettes, even new color palettes and apparel. And so if I could recreate that digitally, then I would cut my design district trips in half. And that would be great. Or what happens, you know, Sunday night at 10 p.m., the design district's not open. But maybe they were 9 p.m. Maybe that's the best time for me to shop instead of interrupting my day to trek over there. So that that definitely resonated with me as a target customer. Fantastic. And the name Open Store, your previous company was Open Door. Was that a coincidence? I mean, Open Door did really well, public company. It, it, it's a moderate coincidence. My friend Daniel Gross actually gave me the name. Um, and as he uh, mentioned the name, uh, it's like, that's actually pretty good. Um, I kind of missed on Open C. It's actually a pretty good name, too. I should have claimed that one uh, as well. But uh, generally, I like the formulation. Amazing. And how did how did your first 10 or so customers come about for Open Store? What was that like? It's a good question because like, uh, there is a challenge in alerting brands, Shopify store owners that we exist, um, that our value proposition exists. It's new. Nobody was buying these businesses before. We're certainly not offering to drive these businesses. And there's 2 million of these Shopify stores and trying to get the attention of, let's call it the 30, 40,000 that are at the right size for us was a little tricky at first. I think we're finally figuring out how to do it uh, well. So what we're basically doing is using the media, like announcing what we're doing, broadcasting what we're doing, and then Shopify stores would find us. I think if there's um, real world conferences, you know, COVID sort of suspended a lot of the real world commerce, uh, you know, conventions and stuff. I think then there'd be a congregation that'd be really easy to explain our value proposition, walk through, you know, the brand owners one by one, what what we can do there for them, you know, kind of a personalized well way. For the last two years, that hasn't really been a scalable opportunity. So I think fortunately that'll start accelerating. We do use some versions of paid marketing, but since there's two million Shopify stores trying to figure out which ones are the 20, 30, 40, 50,000 that we really want. Do paid marketing is a little bit of a complicated endeavor. Certainly. Um, at, at what point do you felt like, hey, you know what? Uh, I guess there's product market fit or maybe a signal of it. Or perhaps, you know, there's some ideas you truly believe in. And you're like, you know, it's, it's a big idea. I'm going to raise a lot of money and just go on this journey because I know it needs to happen. Like, how yeah, so my, my, my view of startups is you start with a vision and then you build it. And then you market it and you sell it. So to me, it's exactly the same as producing a movie. You don't produce a movie by asking consumers what movie do they want to watch, what actor and actress should you cast. It's totally the opposite. You have a story, you have a narrative, you have a script, and then you have to cast characters that can bring that script to life. You have to produce it, which means finance it. You have to cut a trailer that interrupts people and makes them excited about it, and then they buy tickets. That's what building a startup is to me. Now, what do you think of the notion then? Because there's a lot of theory on our product market fit and, and, you know, watching the signals of product market fit and how should founders think about that? Because this is a a contrarian view to probably 80% out of the startup knowledge there, but 80% of the people is not key for a boy. (laughs) No, that's why 80% fail is that they followed the bad advice. Um, So I think it's actually like you build, you build a product and then you market and sell it. That's the goal. Is like you have a vision of how the world can be better, and it's your job to build it and then convince people that the world will be better if they use it. And if you can't do that, maybe you shouldn't start a company. Definitely, I, I love that. Um, how is Open Store able to achieve such a high valuation in a relatively short amount of time? Is it is it your name? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is where you cast some tension in my life because I'm actually, you know, part time VC too. Um, so obviously, the world's corrected a lot of valuations over the last two years. I think we did raise money at Open Store historically under a different world order, like many, many, many companies. And so we need to grow into our valuation, meaning we need to out execute the velocity that would be expected two or three years ago. We need to get rid of every potential yellow flag in our business now. So the scrutiny that venture capitalists apply to startups is just three to 10x greater than it was two years ago. And so that applies to my company just the same way I apply it to other companies I look at that want, you know, checks from founders fund. Definitely. That's, uh, you know, I, I think also your past successes, which is more than most founders out there, predicates that, right? Well, I think it was what resonated with investors, like to decompose it though, uh, was the you know, scale of ambition. Could you build a, a horizontally broad e commerce destination site in the West for the first time since the late 90s? That's obviously something that if you can succeed at, is very valuable, period. So that's very critical for investing. Second is the quality of the team. We have an amazing team. The density of talent is off the charts. Investors are very savvy and uh, very experienced at grading team quality. And so we were able to marshal an incredible team. And then there were some things that we solved early, I believe, in the Elon School of Life, which is you take your biggest risks first and you try to solve them in some order. And so we were able to address some of the risks, not all the risks, but some of the risks pretty quickly. And I love, I love, it's still, it's still ringing in my head. Building a startup is like building a movie, making a movie. You come up with a vision, you cast characters, you market it, you get people excited. But movies also do fail, right? Like in a big endeavor like Open Store, what are some things you do to mitigate those risks of potential failure? So I think what you do is you catalog your biggest risks to start. And there's usually about three of them, plus or minus. And then you want to assign somebody who has an unfair advantage in conquering those risks. And that's how you do build your team. Like in a movie, there are movies that absolutely would have failed but for the right character being cast correctly. I mean, imagine like, for example, uh, Devil Wears Prada without Meryl Streep. Be pretty challenging to pull off that movie, actually. Um, and then there's inspired, and there's sometimes miscast movies that fail probably where with a different actor or actress, you know, maybe they would have thrived. So it's taking your key roles and getting the right person who has the highest probability of success. And that's the best way to avoid failure. But startups are, are challenging. I mean, I think, for example, as an early stage investor, flipping the mirror on myself, would I make seed investments and Series A investments? I want to be right, let's say about 40% of the time. So it's still going to be wrong, roughly 60%, period. Um, so I think startup building is a lot like baseball. 40% is they're like Ted Williams, and you're going to the Hall of Fame. With, with all of this, though, I mean, you've been an expert in building teams. You said it right. It's putting the, the right characters, Devils Wear Prada, wouldn't have been anything without Meryl Streep. So what are some learnings in your journey? I mean, PayPal, LinkedIn, Square, Open Door. Um, how do you build teams from, you know, the most, guess, yeah. the most important lesson I learned from Peter Thiel the first week on my job at PayPal, we went for a jog around the Stanford campus. And his lesson was you need to build teams based upon, predicated on undiscovered talent, meaning people who haven't yet proven that they can do X, Y, and Z. The reason why is, there's always going to be big companies that will throw lots of money and other benefits and perks at people who've already proven X. And you cannot scale a startup competing with like Google's cash, Apple's cash, Amazon's cash, all that stuff. You need people who these large homogenous organizations do not know how to evaluate, which typically means younger. So you want to basically develop a magnet for undiscovered talent. A technique for assessing them. It's a little bit like if you like sports, you're drafting athletes, let's say in Major League Baseball or you know in the NBA, right out of high school. And the art is being right. 
So I, I kind of love reading old scouting reports, you know, of like, I read, uh, for example, Derek Jeter's scouting report from high school. And the scout somehow or another at like 17 years old, like pretty much predicted everything about Derek um, from this, at the time, very lanky, you know, six, two or so kid. He predicted almost everything exactly right. And that's the art of building a company. And then the key traits of this undiscovered talent. And how do you, how do you like find and attract them? I know, like, you know, sometimes easier said than done, right? Like they're younger, but there's also a lot of people chasing after them, a lot of startups right now. I don't think most startups are actually chasing after truly what I call undiscovered talent. Going to Stanford with a CS degree is not undiscovered talent. Undiscovered talent is going to US at University of San Francisco or UC Santa Cruz or you know somewhere not with central casting resumes. So I think that's part of the art is how do you find these people? How do you assess them and know that you found someone special with a non-conventional background? And and what were what are some key things you look for then and uh, key learnings there that someone can immediately pick up from this conversation? It's a good question. Um, usually, these people spike in some way, and you can you can feel see the spike. Um, so they have a trait that they're just extraordinary at. Um, that's the most obvious. That really does stand out quickly. It's very difficult to do not in person. To be fair. I think it's virtually impossible on a Zoom call um, and even figuring out who to meet from like, by definition, from like a profile like LinkedIn, these people by definition, that doesn't show up. Uh, so I think you need, need to have an environment where you meet a lot of people. And that that is tricky because your time is your scarcest, most valuable resource. And so the art, I think, is actually once you have an assessment capability sort of developed and devised and proven, validated is how do you put yourself in front of a lot of people? So some of the best people I've ever hired, some of the best people I've ever funded, actually, I played soccer with. Um, so I w- I'm not sure I'd recommend this for everybody, but like my soccer team was a great way to recruit founders. And and uh, and they probably have networks, the alma maters and, and they and do so actually. So- that, that actually works. You find one or two great soccer players who can be good founders. Not surprisingly, they might know some other people. Definitely. Is that is that also another reason for Miami? I guess the, the move there, a lot of undiscovered talent, no major schools like Stanford um, in the public eye. It definitely helps um, to not have entitled people uh, who've been affected by you know bad ideas, infected by bad ideas for the last five years. Um, so that that is an advantage. Secondly, Miami is a real world culture. People here do not do remote meetings. They never did. They never really shut down during COVID. So if you believe that you need to meet with people in person to detect their potential, um, this city has been great for that. From the day I moved here, I was doing real world meetings starting December 10th of 2020. Wow, that's that's unbelievable. And there is something to be said, right? If we were doing this conversation in person in a studio, perhaps it would go longer. You build stronger connections, right? Anytime you engage more than two senses like taste, touch, sound, smell, you start to build stronger bonds. Oh, absolutely. I hate, for example, doing board meetings by Zoom. I've kind of basically come to the conclusion that I'm going to opt out of board meetings that are done by Zoom. I'll fly across the country to attend board meetings. If they're done in person, I was just flew to San Francisco last week. I attended a board meeting yesterday. Um, so I think if you care about the result, you need to be there in person. Well said. Well said. Now, key hires to make from zero to one million, and let's say one to ten, and then ten to hundred. What are like those one or two key hires that are crucial to make? Well, it, it really does vary. You know, consumer company, an enterprise company, a, a deep tech company. You may be hiring very different people at very different stages. Typically, you know, you have a team that's building something, like just say across all these areas or sectors. Building so people with the skills to build, which may be engineering, design, possibly data science. Once you have something, then you're definitely going to need to showcase that. You can call it marketing, but like one way or the other, getting in front of people and seeing how they interact with it, making sure that you're delighting them. If you're delighting them, you want to amplify that, and that's definitely marketing. So I think you know it's building, validating. Let's say validating delight. 
and then amplifying and then rinsing and repeating, rebuilding, fixing things that could be better, improving, remarketing, all, all of that's like a, a loop. But uh, there's no like a one size fits all answer because consumer businesses typically will be driven by products, later have product metrics, then financial metrics. A deep tech company might have no revenue metrics for a while. And you know, it's all about building for a sustained period of time, validating that you can you create the performance attributes that the market needs or wants or resonate. And then there's other companies where you know the enterprise you may be selling pretty quickly, actually. So let's say for a traditional uh, B2B SaaS company, right? Yeah, so typically there, you're going to build something, but you're going to try to get customers pretty damn quickly, maybe even before you finish building, whether you have alpha, beta customers, development partners. So you're going to be going to market pretty quickly, typically in enterprise, um, especially at the SaaS layer of enterprise infrastructure, you may not be able to do that. Like if you're building a database, new database and stuff, you may have to complete it before someone buys it. But fundamentally, there's an interaction dynamic. So you may have a first go to marketing leader, manager, uh, contributor as early as the core team. Whereas that may get layered in a lot later in other types of companies. And those people can channel feedback from the customers to the product team in some rank order. Um, and the art is ranking the order correctly. Customers will say a lot of things, but they usually only really care about one or two. Definitely. Now, there's a lot that has been said and a lot of advice around specialists and the timing of that versus Swiss Army knives or generalists. Um, what's your advice there? How 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 to think about you know how long to stretch a Swiss Army knife, which is probably someone you hire in the early days versus specialists, or even if there is such a thing. I don't really like specialists. I try to avoid them whenever possible, but there are times and places and the criteria I use for when you want some degree of expertise is, um, are you trying to create value or protect value that's already been created? So on the value creation step, I don't believe in expertise. On the value protection step, I typically do. So for example, if you're doing really, really well, there are things that can go wrong. And typically what experts can do is prevent you from uh, an unforced error sort of. And so that's where the expertise helps. But in creating something that has 10x more value, experts almost always can't help you and they may retard you. Cool. Um, in terms of um, executives and when to hire, like I see this happen a lot. People raise money. Let's say they're 20, 30 people uh, growing really fast, all of a sudden raise maybe 50, 100 million, and then start hiring massive company execs, logos, but not the right fit. How should Startup founders think about it like, you know, I raise my Series A, who are the execs I need in the, in the right seat? Because sometimes hiring those big company execs don't always work out. Well, the big company execs don't work out for several reasons. One is a healthy, well-run, high-growth company is not a microcosm of a large publicly traded company. So it's not like you take an atomic unit and decompose it. They're very, very different animals. So that's the biggest, just pure challenge. Secondly, a lot of successful executives don't have the energy tenacity. They don't really have something to prove. They, they're a little too complacent. Not all, but a lot do. So you have to make sure if you're going to hire from a large company, that this person still has something to prove, still wants to achieve their life's work, um, or I pause. Then third is culture. Different companies have different cultures and different ways of making decisions. And if you're going to hire from a large company, make sure that that company culture is a close cousin to the culture you're building. So for example, Apple's a top-down driven company. It's not a data-driven company. Google is a bottom-up, for the most part, driven company. It is more data-driven. If you're going to be a top-down company, you don't want a lot of people who think bottom-up. If you want to be a design-driven company, you don't want a lot of people who think with data. So you have to kind of match me the kind of company and the culture you're building for your company with people who've learned reasonable proxies of how to make decisions in a similar vibe, via environment. Definitely. Now, as you grow and scale, you say you've got the right people in the right seats, uh, uh, stages, seats, uh, state specific, but then you want to go beyond that 100 million mark. You want to go IPO like you did at Open Door. What are the key ingredients to build a company that eventually goes public? What were your key lessons there with Open Door? 
it's not that dissimilar than the early stage in the sense of one uh, Marshall uh, incredible density of talent. The bet the team you build like other than from Beno Kosla at KB when he's on my board at Square. The team you build is the company you build. That's true in the beginning and it's true at the end. So talent, talent density. Second, what are those key challenges? Every year, the top one, two, or three challenges may change. And so you may want to edit the team to make sure that you have the right person to tackle the three challenges in front of you that year and not 10 years out, but not last year either. So that is one thing I always keep in mind. If you're going to go public, some of the key challenges might shift. Um, and so make sure you have the right person to navigate those challenges with the highest probability of success. That's the ba- that's the basic change is just what's in front of you in the next year is probably going to be different. A lot of what you say is about people in general. I guess people build companies, not the other way around. A lot of this conversation has been around people and corralling the right people. How do you maintain that? The team you start with is the co- the team you build is the company you build. How do you maintain that culture though as you grow from a zero to one company to a sort of fifty to hundred million to IPO? How do you maintain that? That's really hard, right? As you well, there's, more- yeah, it is chal- it's definitely challenging. Period. Okay, so let's not try to gloss over how difficult it is. There are some techniques. One is you can promote people who have the highest slope. Different people have different slopes. How fast do they learn? Find the people who have the highest slope, promote them, challenge them constantly, rinse and repeat. Number two is figure out where you're editing too much, constantly, consistently, where you have to make corrections. Um, and then try to find a person who can quarterback that function, that challenge a little bit better. So opportunistically dipping into the free agent market, so to speak. And then third is you have techniques like management leadership training, which is the way we make decisions at our company is this way. This is how we groom up and coming leaders, managers, if you like managers, uh, fundamentally to teach. And then eventually, or sometimes it's inevitable, um, you can't promote from within all the time, right? You have to probably find sometimes that external expertise. You have to top somebody. What is the best way to have that conversation when you've had this person help you throughout and now needs to be topped? One, how do you know you? Every organization is going to have a different ratio of like homegrown talent that's promoted and external imports. I don't think you want to be zero and I don't think you want to be 100% of either poll. Um, If you get it right, in terms of internal promotions, maybe you can go run with 70% internal promotions. That's really good. That's like having really talented people, grooming them, mentoring them, and letting them run. Them run. Um, 50-50 is a pretty good mix, actually, for a high-growth company. That's pretty damn good because um, you have to compare the slope of an individual with the slope of the company. And the faster the company's growing, uh, sort of, unfortunately, the harder it is for any individual to keep up. And you don't really want to suppress your growth to allow people to you know, exceed them. So the way one way to think about it is if you're a baseball fan is you have started pitchers. And the starting pitchers are, you know, really, really valuable. They're going to get you a lead. And then the art is knowing when your starting pitcher is tiring before they give up the, you know, the home run <laughs> and calling for your relief pitcher. And you know, in the last thirty years of the baseball, people have realized the relief pitchers can be equally valuable and perhaps sometimes more valuable than the starting pitcher. Um, that does change and a pretty radical change in baseball. And so the art is partially knowing when it's time to call for your relief pitcher. But you don't want to do that too often. Or and too how do you have you had challenges having this conversation though with somebody who's who's brought you so far, but now you have to top that person? Like, what is the conversation you have? Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of variables. Like, how obvious is the gap between excellent performance and what the company needs and their current performance? Sometimes it's really a trans, it's really apparent to everybody. Sometimes it's more of a projection of where the world's going and where they are. And that, that's a little more complicated. The best way to do it, I think, is to find someone who is so extraordinary in solving this problem that the person in the seat currently understands and recognizes the delta. That's by far the easiest. Definitely. Now, shifting gears, I want to... I wanna... I guess question you on the fundraising side, or as an as an investor being a GP in a top tier fund here, um, with all the craziness that's going on in the market, or we've seen the up and the down, 
What is driving investment decisions in this current climate and how should founders think about fundraising and valuation? Well, I think, you know, look, the reality is most public companies are trading at 20% to 50% of where they were trading two years ago. And there is no way that the private markets can be completely disconnected from the public markets. So I would just divide any private valuation by probably three, maybe four or five, at least two. And that's probably the starting point for any investor conversation with almost no exception. And so I think people just need to appreciate that reality. Then secondarily, uh, there are people looking for good investments, but they expect the unit economics of these investments to be proven and even at the expense of some growth. So dialing in the marginal economics versus artificially propping up the growth. Investors are very savvy about techniques to artificially prop up the growth and are going to be pretty intolerant of it right now. Have the metrics and expectations for valuations changed though? Like I'd say, let's at seed, series A, series B. I mean, the valuations definitely have changed, but have the re- metrics that you look at uh, dramatically changed? Is it higher? Not necessarily the metrics per se, but the multiple associated with those metrics is definitely different. So, for example, almost no company, it would take an extraordinary set of confluence of factors to get you know, a 10x revenue on a valuation right now. Whereas that was like the minimum amount of the deals were getting done. Um, so like in the public markets right now, there's very few companies that trade at 10x. And that's been the historical norm over 50 years, actually. But for the last three years or so, people forgot that. Um, so anybody who has like $10 million of revenue, it's really rare to be appreciated at more than 10x. And you'd have to have a really strong argument why you're the one of a kind top 10 basis point company that should earn a more than 10x revenue. And so what are you seeing then at, at seed and, and series A predominantly, given the stage you're playing at? Well, seed typically, you know, it's not a multiple because you don't really you really haven't shipped anything or you may not ship certainly not financial metrics. So typically a seed is an artistic judgment. Um, but um of the seeds that have recently been involved in, let's say over the last 12 months, they've ranged from 8 million, 10, 12, maybe, yeah, 8, 10, 12, or the last three uh, seed investments I made. Uh, the, those are posts. Um, series A's are back, you know, in the 20s, maybe 30. Um, B's are more 50, 40 to 80. And that's a pretty significant adjustment. Yeah, given uh, I, I personally know at least 20 founders in my network that have raised A's at three, four, five hundred million valuations that are. Yeah, crying. well, they're going to be, they're going to, they either better make that money last or, you know, they're going to be in for <laughs> a really uh, interesting correction. I mean, you and I both are seeing a lot of shutdowns, a lot of asset sales, a lot of everything is happening. The market is correcting in a big way. Um, what are some common mistakes or pitfalls as you talk to more and more startups uh, that you see that they should avoid? Well, I think the most important thing is reality, which is if a founder hasn't recognized that that $200 million valuation is kind of a non-starter and they want an introduction to me or they do a meeting with us, um, all I'm going to do is say, there's way too much brain damage here. We don't even want to take the meeting. We're just going to pass. So the thing you can do constructively as a founder is proactively reframe the expectations. So you can say, I know we raised money, for example, at 200. Um, I realize the world's different. Here's where we are as a business. And I'm looking for someone who might support us at 40 million. Then I'd say, oh, okay, well, that might be interesting. There's a shot that I could be excited about this at an appropriate price and valuation. So I might take the meeting. But if you walk in, you know, kind of just with blinders on and try to get a meeting at 200, it's going to lead to either no, we don't really want to take the meeting or an automatic pass, which isn't helpful. Certainly. Now, now switching gears for a second, you've been a part of very disruptive companies, right? PayPal, Square, LinkedIn, Open Door, now Open Store, very disruptive companies. How do you balance the need for innovation and disruption? 
with the practicalities of generating revenue and business sustainability? Well, it depends on the business. One maybe component to that is how much money are you spending to get traction? In some companies, it can be zero. Literally, the marginal cost of growth can be zero, in which case, you don't have to worry about what your revenue is if your marginal cost of growth is zero, because any one cent per user is going to be more than zero cent. If you spend any energy up front measured in dollars to get traction, you need to figure out really quickly how to how fast it's been, how fast you can pay that back. So if you spend a dollar to acquire a customer and a plus customer or consumer, or whatever it is, you need to figure out how fast you earn a dollar of profits. And the faster that loop, the more that validates A, that you have a pretty good business, probably B, that you have product market fit, C, that you understand the levers in your business, all of which are good things. So I look at the payback time. That's the number one criteria for me. And if I was the founder, that's the number one criteria I'd be measuring is payback. Fantastic. Certainly. I mean, if you keep spending like uh, drunk sailors, like people did in the last couple of years, then uh, you are going to beat the fate that you are in the market is forcing you to. Exactly. Now, given you have a keen eye for disruption and, and great trends here, what are some emerging trends or in industries that you find super exciting or ripe for disruption in the near future? Maybe somebody takes an inspiration from here, from our conversation and builds something. Well, I don't want to overly disappoint you, but I don't really think it comes to trends very much. I'm in the business of backing founders who identify trends and have a calculated a probability of you know sort of mastering those trends and riding a wave. Um, so I'm in the business of letting founders sort of educate me. I very very rarely have like a macro idea uh, that's worth pursuing. To quantify that, I'd say like every three to five years, um, I have a I have a provocative idea. So I just wait for people who have a brilliant insight about the world, have some secret the world hasn't appreciated and have an unfair advantage in being successful. And then um, excited, ecstatic, uh, you know, to help propel them. But uh, so I don't spend a lot of time trying to come up with my own ideas. Now, given you've invested in Airbnb and uh, LinkedIn in the early days and YouTube, Palantir, what did you see? Like, what was that, that spark in the, in the founder that, that drove you to invest? Well, there's different sparks in each of those people. Brian, you could tell three minutes in the conversation was a machine. Uh, uh, he literally gave me a monologue of three minutes on why Airbnb was going to be successful. He had very specific data points um, to prove it um, from the earliest possible days. It resonated. As soon as he finished the three minute monologue, I said, This is cool. I need to invest. This is the best thing I've seen since YouTube. The direct quote is so obvious. Palantir, as soon as I heard the vision, um, as Joe Lonsdale will tell the story well, I was actually the only person who immediately resonated with. Everybody else had to be talked into it. Um, so it, it, it's different. LinkedIn, because I had a more traditional background starting in law, I think I appreciated the potential value of LinkedIn more than most people in tech. They were kind of like free, kind of weird free agents from different different career paths. Uh, so it, when when Reed explained the future of LinkedIn as your online resume and your what he used to call shingle. Um, shingle actually for a lawyer resonates really well. So the vision just was immediate, immediately sparked. I said, worked with Reed for a couple of years at PayPal, said confidence in his ability uh, to ship stuff, build stuff, recruit a team, et cetera. So it's all very different. And a lot of uh, investments you do is is it is it more from the network like that? People you know who who've worked with other founders can vouch for them or have you done any cold email deals? Because you get probably cold emails all the time. Oh, I, I definitely do both. I wish, I like literally wish I could, uh, you know, scale just investing in people that I already know. Um, the reason why is it's a lot easier to make an assessment the more data points you have. You know, a 20 minute meeting is like one data point you're trying to draw. You can, you can literally draw an infinite number of lines through one data point. So it's not particularly uh, easy. Uh, the more data points you have about somebody, the more you should be able to draw a line about the potential of their slope, where they're going to plateau, et cetera. So the more it's just a, doing my job successfully is a hell of a lot easier with people that have a lot of common data points. That said, a lot of people that start companies and do really well are not people that I know. So I have to get proficient at 
meeting and identifying and assessing people that I have very limited context on, but that's really hard. So for example, FAIR was one of the better investments I've made in my life. Two of the founders had played soccer with me, but also worked for me at Square. And the way I looked at their pitch was, look, I need to make this call 100% of the time correctly. Like, can these two people pull this off? And if I can't do that, I should quit. Um, now, on the other hand, if I just have coffee with someone for the first time, there's other people on the planet um, that you know, should be able to assess them well, too. And so I don't have such an unfair advantage. Definitely. That's, that's well put. As we close out here, you seem to be super high energy after two decades of doing startups. You seem to be in great shape. Any personal habits or routine that you believe have contributed to your ongoing success as an entrepreneur and investor? Well, sleep. I'm a, I've been maniacal about getting eight hours sleep, you know, pretty much all my life. Uh, so there's no substitute for quality sleep in terms of health, fitness, brain power. Um, so I prioritize sleep. Um, secondly, I do believe in discipline, meaning um, you want to do the same thing every day. So my plan is to make things that are not necessarily fun a habit. And so they're never a conscious choice. So I do the same workout every single day for six or seven years with no excuses. Like if I was dying, I'd probably try to figure out a way to do the workout. Um, because once I skip it once, then the next day is optional. And I don't want anything important to become optional. So my brain's kind of wired that way. I think things compound that way. But basically, turning discretionary decisions into non-optional decisions creates the compounding network effect. So that's, that's been really helpful. And then be truthfully, things are fun. If you find the right people, uh, even really challenging roller coaster rides are fun working with the right people. Definitely. Life and business is not about the journey or the destination, but the, but the companions. And, and I can tell with your, with your fitness level because your bicep vein is popping from the soup. And, and it's very rare to get to that level of body fat. I'll so keep, kudos. I'll, I'll keep working on it. I'm going to do another workout. Uh, kudos, kudos to you for that. Finally, uh, as we close off, any unconventional advice you've seen founders ignore but shouldn't? Well, you know, the top down creating the movie is obviously pretty controversial. I have another set of thoughts around like trade offs between um, decisions, how to make those decisions. I learned from Reed Hoffman, which is strictly rank your priorities. Do not do a pros and cons list. It's a long topic, but basically rank order everything first and then make a decision on the top priority, then the second, third, not try to array into like an accounting bookkeeping system. And then third, value time. Like Peter Thiel taught me this. Systematically, people undervalue their time. It's the only resource that's completely scarce. Leverage it. Think about how, and that requires some discipline. Be ruthless on your time. Be willing to say no. My favorite expression I borrowed from Margaret Thatcher is no, no, no. So try to say no, no, no to things. So you can say yes to the things that are really, really, really important and energizing. Yeah, if it's not a hell yeah, then it's it's always a no. Awesome. You've been super active on Twitter, R-A-B-O-I-S. Um, I think you single-handedly probably drove the startup movement that shifted to Miami. Um, anywhere else you're active other than Twitter that we can follow your wisdom? Not really. I try to concentrate most of my efforts on Twitter. I use new platforms when they come out. There's a lot of... Uh, I posted a lot on Quora a while ago. A lot of those answers are still quite relevant to these topics. So I will send them around to founders. Uh, people feel free to consult them. Uh, but Twitter is my primary content creation platform now. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Keith. Wishing you great success. Another IPO in, in short order. Thank you so much and have a good one. Take care. Awesome. I need some traction.